ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jerry Deaton, and I am the writer and director of the Views of Breton County. Thank you so much. <laughs> this has been three years, folks, in the coming. I've been waiting on this, and we all know why. COVID has just gotten in the way of everything. But it's been three years since we've had a, a play on the stage, and I am sick of it. And with 17 cast members, we just literally crossed our fingers every night and hoped that we could crawl across the finish line. We so thank you all for coming out and supporting us. People are here tonight from, let's say, Breton County or Perry or somewhere back in that area. Drove all the way, okay? Nice and proud. Well, uh, we all, especially the Breath of County, we understand the views, and we, uh, we grew up with them. For me, for example, when I came to Frankfurt in 1986, uh, you know, I had a limited understanding of the views. We didn't talk about it much. Nobody had did much anymore in the 70s and 80s. But I noticed something. When I would go out on the road, I worked for the Legislative Research Commission. When I'd go out on the road, I'd tell people my name. They'd ask who it was. I'd say, when I told, I said Deaton, they'd go, Bloody Brett. <laughs> and I could not figure out why. And then one day, again, I was in the law library at the Capitol, and I came across a book on Breath of County Feuds, got to flipping through it. And just all of a sudden, I found where my great-great-grandpa Bob Deaton had killed somebody. So I went home uh, that evening and I called you, Dad. They're my dad in the second row here. And if I get anything wrong tonight, you all, he's going to tell me. No doubt about it. I'll hear about it. Uh, in, in front of you all. So uh, I called Dad and I said, Dad, did Grandpa Bob kill somebody? And he, his answer was, Well, I always heard he did. And Grandpa Bob was a minister. <laughs> so there. So that kind of piqued my interest in, in the, got my interest started in the news. And then we also have a cabin in our uh, backyard. My aunt Ollie lives there now on, the, on Longs Creek in Breath County. And the cabin's still there. And a picture of John Amos is hanging on the wall. And I think somewhere in this crowd tonight is John Amos' great, great, great grandson. Where are you? Right there he is, folks. Is that John Paul? Except you spell it A-M-O-S and he spelled A-M-I-S. You said you go A-M-I-S too? Okay. Um, so anyway, folks, that's how I, I just got very interested in it. Ten years ago I made a film on the feuds. I decided we could also adapt it to stage. I thought that would be a pretty good idea. I think it's worked out really well. We've gotten a real good response to it. Uh, appreciate you all coming out. Look at this crowd. This is fantastic. Just really uh, love performing in front of uh, There's way over 100 people here tonight. Well, we are the Bluegrass Theater Guild. That is who is uh, the theater group putting this on tonight. We're a group that's been around. I have to get the exact date, but I think we've been in Frankfurt since about 1982. Uh, we are partnering tonight with the Kentucky Historical Society. How about that? <laughs> Not everybody gets to do that, I don't think, or at least I'm going to say they don't. Uh, you know, we're a wonderful facility here. If you haven't ever been here, uh, the Thomas Clark uh, Center for Kentucky History is just fantastic. So try to go through the, the museum at some point. Uh, we love it. Hope to be back at some point as well. There's so many people to thank. If you get a chance tonight, Look in your program and see the people who bought advertisements. And uh, you know, without them, we, we would have trouble making it. So we really appreciate them. Appreciate the History Center. A few things I have to, business things I have to go through. Bathrooms out that way. Probably a lot of you already found them. Uh, exits there, there, and in the back. So we're not planning on you all needing those tonight. We're hoping not. Uh, refreshments are available out there. 
and if you buy any refreshments, uh, the money goes to the Peggy King Scholarship Fund. Peggy was a friend of mine years ago. Uh, she has passed away, but there's a scholarship in her name. So anything you buy out there is going to go to her scholarship. Also, we have a few of our posters left. Five dollars each will get you one of these, and the money is all going to go to the Peggy King Scholarship Fund. So I think these are probably going to be pretty valuable someday. I'm pretty sure they are. <laughs> so, uh, and I'll even sign them, and that'll make them worth at least a dollar. <laughs> That's what they call them. So, um, let's see. Okay, this is important. You're going to have loud noises tonight. And I think somewhere about the fifth or sixth row, you all are going to have really loud noises. So just kind of be ready for it. Uh, be prepared. It's going to be a good show, folks. Now, I want you all to sit back and enjoy the fuse of Bloody Bread. Yes, sir, that's me. Sir, I have your tickets to Ashland, Kentucky, which transfers to your final destination of Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're a good man. Thank you. Thank you very much. Say, don't mind me asking, mister, but you've been uh, walking about town all day. What exactly brought you here to Jackson? Oh, I don't mind at all. You see, I've been in Kentucky covering the inauguration of your new governor, Albert Benjamin Happy Chandler. And it just so happens I spent time in Jackson, oh, some 30 years ago, and just wanted to see how things had changed. Mister, things don't never change around here, <laughs> at least not so as you can tell. Oh, my good man, they, things have changed. Indeed, they have. If you say so. <laughs> Well, you're welcome to wait here at the depot with these other folks if you'd like. Your train will be here in about an hour and a half. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, folks. I see you're waiting for the train as well. You heard me telling the station master that it's been quite a while since I was here last. And I cannot stress upon you sufficiently how things have changed. Indeed. Why, on one of my first visits here in 1903, the Kentucky militia had been sent here. Machine gun nest on Main Street. Things were, well, rather tense. You see, there was a big trial about to commence due to, well, a series of, how should I say, difficulties that had taken place. Ah, Jackson was used to that back in those days. I'll tell you what, though, folks, that really wasn't even half the story. You know what? We got a little time for the train. 
I think I'll tell you some stories. So, sit back, get comfortable, and I'm going to take you back to 1873. October, to be exact. 1873. Right here on Long's Creek in Breathitt County, Kentucky. The place where all the feuds took their root. William's been going after the water a long time, John. He's fine, Sally. You are not sending him out there like that. Now you reckon that water's gonna get in here? Hmm? That barrel over there don't hold a two day supply. We've been pinned in here for three days now. Right. He ain't no kid to us, and there's no blame on him for the fighting. It won't harm William. I done told you that. Bill Strong's bound to defend every free Negro man in this here county, I reckon. That door shut. You know it's broke. So make sure it is. A youngin crawled out there yesterday after them red pepper you hung on the wall. I like they never got it to come back in. Still yet, John. It's a hundred feet over to the creek and it's dark out. They might think he's one of us. Sally, well there is a big full harvest moon out tonight. And the Williams big feller, he's got that limb. They can see him. Guarantee they know exactly who he is. They'd have killed him the first time he stepped out that front door, if that weren't the case. Oh, why did this have to happen? Damn you, damn you, John Amos, for taking on them Strongs. Every one of us is gonna end up dead over this. We got a baby. What are we do if we can't get out of here? Woman, well, you know they left us no choice. Hell far. Man can't just take something that don't belong to him. Well, he wanted to take more than that. I, I don't want to hear no more about what them Strongs took from you and your old daddy there. Three you've been going around this county for six or seven years now. After the war's done and over. Taking people's property. And now you're killing each other because you can't decide how to divide up the plunder in a fair manner. Captain Bill and them red strings ought not come over this part of county. Well, he knows Lost Creek's his and Middle Fork's mine and Pat. Uh, well, I guess getting your leg shot out from under you back in the summer didn't knock no sense into your head. Them strongs you're not to be fooled with, John Amos, and you know it. By God, we killed part near a dozen of them since the war. I got a good number of us, but, but we're the law around here. I figured it'd stay that way. By God. It'll stay that way till you're dead, I reckon. I guess me and the baby will have to go out to Kansas with my kin. I'll not stay here by myself. Well, hell for. We've been at it with them strong since 18 and 10. I reckon we'll be at it with them till 19 or 10. I got if they want it that way. I got that's right, Pat. They can't just go around and accuse a man of stealing hogs and get by with it. Now, if we pin them in their house back in the summer, should I reckon they know we mean business? You mean business, all right. 
Two of you led armies after one another last month. Looked like civil war was starting back up again. People all up and down this creek's paying for what you two are doing. Well, good, the war ain't never ended back up in here. And you fools were fighting on the same side seven years ago. Fighting on the side of them Yankees. Yeah, it took me a spell long, man, there. Well, what happened, Lee? Captain Bill came down out in the woods. Had a few words. Yeah. What did that old devil have to say? Well, said he's aiming to kill you. Said it don't matter how long it takes. Said he's a patient, man. Oh, God, John, what are we gonna do? Seen me a fire on the other side of Long Creek, up about 100 yards up the hill, uh, behind that long strand of pines. Looked like they sit in there for a good spell. Well, by God, we'll see about that. We've got plenty of food in here, and it won't shoot you, William, so we can still get water. Well, I reckon that's gonna come to an end, too. They said that's the last one they're gonna let me bring in. Wait! Get up, peek out there in her hole and see if they're showing themselves out there. Mr. White, I done told you Captain Bill's men's out there. No need me poking my head in that little hole to see. Every last one of them is crack shots. Every last one of them. Besides, didn't an Indian shoot an arrow through that hole at you back when you people was tussling with them a long time ago? Now, William Freeman, I asked you to get up and look at that air window because the strong, they ain't got no quarrel with you. Well, I reckon you're the only one in here. Besides that baby there and baby Sally that they won't take a shot at. I don't know about that, Pap Wiley. They went and shot at John and William when they were out front throwing corn cobs at each other, a horse and around. One of them shot a cob right out of William's hand. So I reckon they mean business for him, too. Nah. Well, no, sir. You know them Strongs protect all you freemen since the war ended. I reckon but it might be just coming down on us, so. You can peek out there and see what's going on. see nothing. I reckon they're still up there in them pine trees. I see some smoke still coming from them. I smell it too. I'm smelling me some bacon. Sally, you think I might have a small piece of that fat back? Sit down there, William. I'll fix you some. Oh, it's a good thing we ain't got no windows in this cabin. I reckon they'd have shot out that light a long time ago. Man, we'd be sitting in this cabin all night long in the dark. <laughs> Thanks, Miss Sapp. Said William, here at for some help. We got some kin over around Crockettsville, and uh, they'd be over here in a few hours if we need them. Yep, I sure wish we could. William, well, you reckon they intend to kill you if you leave out of here again? I don't know, but I don't intend to find out. Uh, them strongs won't harm no Negro. You know that. 
Bill Strong took sides again at KKK, and everybody knows that. That Captain Bill's a tough man. I hear he witted 20 women. I hear tell it he rode his horse into a man's house and killed him at his supper table, surrounded by his children. Oh no, I ain't taking no chances. I stay in the fight, Mr. John. But I reckon if I go outside, they kill me no matter what color I am. John, when this is all over with, I want you to ride straight to Jackson and get the law on that Bill Strong and that bunch of his. Sally, well, you know that ain't no use. Hell far. There ain't been no law in Bradley County since the war ended. We can't even get a circuit judge to ride in town long enough to settle for a trial. Besides, you can go out there and get settled right here anyhow. War's done right break the county. It ain't a fitting place for nobody to live no more. Think about taking back the logging this spring? Sure was a lot of timber out there on the Long Creek. Yeah. You know me and old Pat Perry was talking about doing just that. We get us a couple mules, a few wagons. Hey, we'll make us up a raft, take down to Franklin. Shit, there's money in that. I swear to God, these chestnut and poplar timber bigger rounds I am tall up them hills. But a cat log on this here cabin, 40 feet long, 20 inches wide. They cut out a poplar right here on this ground. <laughs> I sure was a big one, son. <laughs> Took us all day to cut her down. Pert near all yellow, too. And bugs won't touch no yellow poplar. Hey, uh, what you working on there, William? Ah, uh, it's a world of better for a baby over there. Poor little thing ain't got nothing to play with. Just keep going after them red peppers Miss Sally growed in the garden and hung out there on the porch to dry. Well, thank you, William. Oh, little John show he's getting around, ain't he? I bet he can't wait to spring. Well, I bet he'd be walking by there. The way he's going, he'll be walking by Christmas. <laughs> Should have seen him yesterday. He crawled right out on that front porch before any one of us even knowed it. Scared me half to death.
go to sleep, you little baby. Go to sleep, you little baby. Your mama gone away and your daddy's gone to stay. Didn't leave nobody but the baby. Go to sleep, you little baby. Go to sleep, you little baby. Everybody's gone in the cotton and the corn Didn't leave nobody but the baby Go to sleep, you little 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 baby John, you reckon we ought to pick ourselves a little bit of that channel coal up a crack a piece, sir? See, maybe we can sell some of that this spring, too. Yeah. You know, I see that little scene the other day. I was thinking we might do just that. There probably ain't much of that in all of Redley County. Yeah, we might be the only ones that have any and get rich off of that. Well, hit your burns hard and far, Wood. Damn shame you got to work so hard to bend no dig it out of the ground, no. That little hod full there, like the plum there broke my back. You fools talk a mighty big talk now. <clears throat> Have you figured how we're gonna get out of this mess we're in? No, Sally. I hate it. But I'll be damned if I'm gonna sit here in my own house and shiver and shake like a dog waiting to get killed. <clears throat> Will you? A lot of stuff in the land, but I don't like sitting here in the dark. Mr. John, you think that's a good thing to do? I mean, I know we only got that little hole to look at. I like the goddamn lamp, will you? I'll not be scared in my own house. By God, Bill Strong will rot in hell before I sit here like a coward, afraid of it. Yes, sir, Mr. John. Be careful, William. That's my fancy lamp. Oh, yes, Miss Sally. Right nice, Miss Sally. Right nice. Yeah, William, what was that you working on there? 
a whirly what? It's called a whirly bird. Seen it in Jackson during coat days. Young fella was playing with one. He showed me how to make it. See, you got a rubber stick against these ridges with another stick, and it makes the twig go round in the circle. I had to find the nails small enough and, and file it down so the, so the twig can go round in the circle. Well, that baby can't play with that. Why, well, it can't even hold it right now. Why, well, it'll make it too by spring. Why, well, that youngin's growing like a weed. Baby, he's going out on the porch. Yes, sir, folks, that's pretty much how it started with the strong Amos feuds. You know, <clears throat> the Civil War left things a mess back in the mountains. And the violence progressed from there. But now, the big feud's about to start. The granddaddy of them all, the Hargis Markham feud. You know, the Hatfields and McCoys had what, 12 dead in a dozen or so years? Well, that pales in comparison to the death toll in Jackson, Kentucky. Men like me from, well, the Washington Times, the Chicago Sun newspapers all across the country pretty much lived in Lexington, Kentucky, and here in Jackson, just waiting for the next big story to take place. You know? We've still got some time before the train comes. I'll tell you what happened. Have you seen the incorporation papers for the Eastern Kentucky Hardwood Company? I know I laid them on this table just last year. They want to build five big mills up at Quicksand. And I have to file those papers today in order to beat the Day Brothers Lumber Company to the punch, as they say. JB, dear, they're right there on the top shelf where you placed them carefully last night. But I know that's not all you're filing today. Oh, yes, well, here they are. Hmm. Do you have little JB ready? I simply must leave in the next uh, five minutes or so in order to get to the clerk's office just as it opens at 8.30. You plan to take Junior with you again today? I do indeed. Uh, JB Markham. I have given of myself freely to you all these years we've been married. And by all accounts, you are a good man and father. I have given you five children and, and rarely had a word to say regarding your business matters. But I know you are filing that election, I mean, challenging that election and filing those papers today. JB, dear, you must swear to me, 
swear on your life that they're not gonna, those monsters aren't gonna shoot you because you carry a baby. Abelia, my dear, this is not the way I want things to be by any measure. You know as well as I that there is a code amongst even the most vile of mountain men, allowing that children will not be harmed in the quest of vengeance. And you know they shot your uncle, the dreaded Captain Bill Strong, right off of his horse with his grandson riding along behind. Poor little thing had his arms wrapped around your uncle's waist. They did not harm the boy. He was allowed to run on home unharmed. That is the point. The point, J.B., is that this is our child. And an infant at that. I cannot believe this is happening. My darling, I have walked to work with you and the children dozens of times, and, and nothing has happened. You even said yourself that last week two men who were seemingly in wait got up and ran when you and our other children walked towards them. It is a shame, but simply how the situation is. Then let's leave this godforsaken place. More than 40 men and women have died this year alone. Most right here on the streets near the courthouse. It's simply not worth it to stay any longer, JB. Dear, you are a trustee for the Kentucky State College. U.S. Commissioner for this district. Your clients include some of the largest and richest railroads in Kentucky. We could have a good life in Lexington. I will not be run off from my home and my town. I was born and raised in Jackson. We own four valuable tracts of land right here in Bretha County. I have established a, a large business, although I cannot attend to it just now. It is hard for a reputable man to be forced to leave his home because of threats of assassins. But if I have to fight, then I want to fight here at home. And if I have to die, then I want it to be here at home. Then I resign myself into your trust. It seems there's no other way. My dear, I must ask this of you. What will you do if indeed I am at some point king? It is a harsh question but one that the realities of the situation require that I ask. You are, you are truly a good man, J.B. Markham. And I promise you this, if in fact you are killed, <clears throat> if, in fact, you are killed, I will spend every last dollar on earth I can command in order to punish your murderer. And I will. I do so love you, my dear. And I believe that right will prevail and that peaceful conditions will be restored to this county and my practice resumed. Now then, I shall take little Jamie and we shall arrive at the courthouse just before 
I have asked my brother Tom to retrieve the boy just as I arrived. Whereupon, he shall be returned safely to you here at home. Come on, little man. Good day, Abelia, my dear. I shall see you at noon. Things to be better. 
we are a center of commerce here in the mountains. I got, I got my pistol. I ain't afraid to use it. Lord, I know that, Mr. Markham. That time, you dropped out on a room full, including the judge and the sheriff made that clear. They know you ain't to be taken lightly. I was in the wrong that day. And I surrendered myself to the city marshal. Paid a $20 fine. <laughs> the judge pulled a pistol too, but we had him covered. <laughs> he wouldn't pay a fine or admit any guilt. He knows he tried to vote a minor in that school board of nation. He and others stuffed the bath box Bought him the votes to get him where he is today. Mm, that Judge Hargis is a powerful man, Mr. Markham. They say that store brings in over twelve hundred a month. And what with his brother Alex, uh, the senator, they can pretty much do what they want. Yeah, we'll see about that. We will find a way to have him and Sheriff Callahan charged with the murder of Dr. Cox. And as the Lord is my witness, Tom White and Curtis Jack will stand trial for killing Marshal Cockle. Ooh, you better watch out for them two. I seen them both up there around the courthouse earlier today and Judge Hargis and Sheriff Callahan are sitting out in front of Hargis's store. They are planning something and you best watch out for yourself and that young Moses. You must stay out of sight, both today and this coming week. I intend to file the election contest papers today. After that, we'll just have to see what happens. Oh, it will not be good, I'm sure of that. I will be in contact. Good day, Moses. Good day, Mr. Markham. Good. about that, my friend. Oh. JB, I see you and little Junior made it to town quite well. We did indeed. Please see to it that our little man makes it home immediately to his mother. I'll get right to it, my brother. Thank you, Tom. You know, Curtis Jet, Tom White are about town today. Yonder are such Judge Hargis and Sheriff Callahan right in front of the Hargis store. I have it on good word that they intend to do me harm. I'm armed, so let them try. Well, I, I thought you were off to Lexington to a convention. I was supposed to go, but a federal prisoner has been lodged oh. in town, and being U.S. Commissioner, I must see to him. And as you know, I intend to file the election contest petition today. Oh, oh and they know as well. It's not safe for you, I fear. And what about you, sir? They're after you as well for your affiliations with me. And you are a witness to many of their foul deeds. Well, I sleep with one eye open. You can believe that. Well, I've heard from several people. They intend to burn my hotel at the first opportunity. Well. And that information is so well known, the insurance company refuses to carry my policy any further. Mm -mm -mm. 
steal. Sir, you are a deputy sheriff and sworn to uphold the law. And I will do my job as well. And I won't be sweet. Oh, say, have you heard if the Democrats intend to nominate Judge Little for circuit judge? If so, the fusion ticket will not challenge. No, not as yet I'm not. But it needs to happen and restore some peace to this county. That's right. Now, on to this. That Tom White is a bad man. Oh, I'm afraid of that man. Oh. what somebody's gone and done? It sure is, boys. <laughs> yes, sir. Things were tough in Breathitt County in those days and justice was hard to find. The Markham killing was brazen even by the standards of the day. And its notoriety was so far spread that there was a song written about it. <laughs> Now let me think. I think I can remember a little bit of it if you'll indulge me here. It it was a fourth of it was a fourth of May, about half past eight that day, with J. B. Markham standing in the door of the courthouse of his town where Kurt Jett was lurking round to get a chance to lay him on the floor. Now Markham had a wife to mourn him all her life and his children had to bear it well and brave. But that little Curtis Jett, Thomas White and others yet are the ones that laid poor Markham in the grave. <laughs> yes. Well, now you know why I went into the newspaper business. <laughs> I tell you what, folks, I think it's just about dinner time, huh? What do you think? <laughs> so I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to step up into town here to this little diner on the corner. Yes, sir. Hey, why don't you go with me? We'll be back in 15 minutes, I'm sure. Well, folks, I must say that that was tasty. <laughs> now, where were we? Ah, yes. On to the infamous Judge James Hargis, a power broker like few had ever seen. Almost bigger than life. A man from whom we all sought to obtain a quote 
and whose picture would sell an infinite number of papers all across the country. A man who held a steel grip on Breathitt County for almost a decade. He was, however, mortal, just like the rest of us. into him, I hope. And you don't think he's just like you. You'd have done the same thing. Oh no, you have done the same thing, but with a way worse ending. By hell, he'll not do that again. I taught him better than that just now. James Henderson Hargis. That boy spent his whole life wondering when somebody's going to shoot him through his bedroom window just to get even with you. That's the way it is around here, isn't it? You just kill whoever you want, whenever you want, an eye for an eye. 
I swear to God, that is the last time I watched you beat that boy. Sorry you had to witness that. That's okay, Judge. Judge, I need some stole pipe, but I don't think you have what I'm looking for. Well, you know I might have what you need in the back room, Bill. Uh, let me go back there and look. I'll be back in a minute. I, I think we got what you need. All right. Well, if and you don't, that's all right. I can just wait. No I'll problem. I'll be back. So this is the famous Hargis Mercantile. It's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. I heard it was supposed to be the biggest place in all the mountains of East Kentucky. It's plenty big enough. Three or four times the size of my place over on Long's Creek. Yeah, and that was the place they shot me three times through the window. When was it? When? May the 4th. The same day they said that you and the judge had J.B. Markham killed. They shot you three times. How did you survive that? I told you not to bring that up no more. There's a lot of rough people in this county, and that's how stories get started. And none of them have much truth to them. Now you take the judge here. He won't hardly let nobody even take a picture of him. And he don't think much of reporters. And I told you, he probably ain't gonna take to know what is it you say you are, a, a play what? A playwright. Leon F. Ellis from Lexington, Kentucky. At your service. Well, you ain't at my service. And I don't need nothing from you. I brought you here to settle this thing you're wanting to do once and for all. If the judge says it's okay to write some kind of story on him, it's fine with me. As for me, I don't want no more attention brought to what's happened. But you've got the greatest story of all. Didn't some uh, Deaton fellow come after you with a knife stabbed you 12 times when you were sheriff? The newspapers all said that you almost had your arm cut off. And you survived that too. <laughs> what a play this is gonna make. <laughs> Don't name that no more. That's all over and done with. And I can tell you right now, you're wasting your time and probably in way over your head. You know, Bill, uh, I think this might be what you need right here, my friend. Uh, that'll be a dime. Well, it's 25 cent piece. Well, thank you, Bill. Well, thank you, Judge. Well, I'll tell you, Bill, Ma, I ain't been a judge for quite some time now. But I do appreciate the support of you and your family. Well, Judge, you got my boy off of that murder charge. I won't never forget you for it. <laughs> well, Ned Callahan, what are you doing way over here? Who's, who's running things over on Longs Creek? Somebody will take off with everything you've got in your store. Judge, I brought this here feller in to talk to you about something. He's been 
bothering me to death over wanting to write a story about you and me. I told him no, but he won't go away. I figured maybe you might be able to put this thing to rest. Mister, are you a reporter? Because if you are, I've got very little to say. All my troubles are behind me now that I made my last payment I owed J.B. Markham Twitter after the courts robbed me and said his life was worth $8,000. No, sir. I'm a playwright from Lexington. And what's been going on here in Breathitt County is a story of fantastic proportions. And I'm writing a play about it, the sheriff, and you. <laughs> you don't say. Well, just, uh, what are you going to say about me and Mr. Callahan here? Well, I'm afraid I can't tell you that now. You're going to have to see the play with everybody else, I suppose. But I heard that you went to Lexington and you bought yourself a coffin and you told them to hold it until it was needed. Did you really pay $1,500 for a coffin? That's the stuff that legends are made of. <laughs> and I'm telling you, we're going to fill the Lexington Opera House for a year. No, no, no. We're going to go to Broadway in New York City. Is that what you got written there in your hand? Uh, yes. I just finished it this week. And I just needed a few good quotes to help with the publicity. And that's Coffin's story. That's a real one. Let me see that play. Well, I don't think I can do that because what if you didn't like something and I wanted to keep it and this and that? Let me see that play. No, I don't think I have to do that because this is my story. And it tells a story of deep down in the heart. Mr. Ellis, is it? Yes. Mr. Ellis, I never ask a third time for anything. There's a train, leaves for Lexington in two hours. You and Mr. Callahan will be on it. If you have any baggage at the hotel, it will be sent to you. Now, when he comes back tomorrow, I want this play in his hand along with a signed guarantee that you will not write another. If, and only if, I get that statement, then no harm will come to you, sir. Do you understand what I'm saying, Mr. Ellis? Yes, sir. I believe I do. Good day, gentlemen. I've got a store to run. Judge, Judge, you need to know something. Oh, well, Bill, why don't you just up and tell me? 
Well, Judge, Judge Boy, Jordan, is down the street at Dr. Hogg's drugstore saying he's going to kill you. I tell you, Bill, that boy has caused me more trouble than everything else combined. I tried my dead level best the last few years to get that boy to walk a straight and narrow path. Refused all my efforts. Thrown it right in my face, he has. Well, and, and he was at the pool hall last week saying, before long, either him or you were going to be in the bottomless pits of hell. They claimed after you beat him up last week, he intended to set things straight. Shit. <laughs> that boy ain't got the nerve to stand up to no man, especially not one who says better in every way. All right, we'll just see about that. A judge, you want me to take that gun that's laying there off somewhere else? No, no, just leave it laying there where it is. Judge, I think you need to look over by the door. Beecher's done come back. Yeah, back I see it has. Probably just wants more money. He got his last dime out of me. You're a mean son of a bitch and I'll take no more. <laughs> Is it? No. Oh lordy, what's happened? Beecher, what have you done? I killed that sorry son of a bitch and I'm glad of it. Young Beecher was indeed convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. But, as was often the case, he was pardoned by the governor after serving only a few years. He immediately moved to Canada where it's rumored that he joined the army. And it's thought that he <coughs> perished somewhere in Europe in the Great War. A sad turn of events indeed. Sheriff Ned Callahan would retire to his store on Long's Creek. He would have more trouble with the Deatons and the Smiths, and it would not end well.
middle fork of the Kentucky River, beginning at a Buckeye tree, standing just below the road, near the house of where said parties live, thence running down Middle Fork River. Fence, fence, not fence, where it meanders to Granville Turner's line. No, Granville Turner, fence with a conditional line to the upper end of the apple orchard at Elsom across said creek. Yes, I bought that property on December 24, 1906. That's exactly how the deed of sale reads. Yes. Yes. No, hell no, it don't read. Stops by the fort locust near the fence by the cow pasture. Damn it to hell, that's been put in there by one of them Smiths that's trying to block me a selling this piece of land. Yes, you get over to the courthouse and make double damn sure that's how it reads. Don't make me have to come over there. I've got the goddamn copy of the Breathitt County News that it's in when it was sold. You have J. Wise Higgins call me back. It's his paper. He'll back me up on this. Now take care of this. Daddy, I thought you wanted to keep that piece of property over on Elson Creek. What's well, right by the river, you said it'll be valuable someday when they build a road right through there. Why are you selling it? Honey, I can't tend to all the things I got right now. This store keeps me busy every day of the week. In the middle of that, I have to go off to Louisville and buy my stock. Then it takes two days to raft it up river all the way from Jackson. I'm so afraid for you to ride that raft, Daddy. There's so many men that seem out to get you. It wouldn't take nothing for one of them to shoot you from the bank. Well, now, Lillian, don't you worry none about me. They can't hurt me none. <coughs> they can't hurt you none. What about two years ago, on this very day, where somebody shot you out of the hill right there? Right through that very window. What about John Deaton going after you a few years ago? With a butcher knife. He nearly cut your arm off and he would have killed you. Wilson had been there and killed him. Poor little Willie. I hate that he had to get into it with them Deans. By God, he showed his grit, didn't he? Your little brother was a man even at 15. When's this all gonna end, Daddy? <coughs> You've made an enemy of just about everybody in the county. The Smiths and the Deatons are sworn to get back at you over mother. I don't want to hear nothing further over time, Andy. Your mother made her choice when she took up with that low down John Smith. And him a friend of mine for years. She tried to come back to you after. After John throwed her out, I'll not have none of that. And then her brother, John Deaton, come in here to kill me over her too? No, sir. By God, I'll have none of that. I've 
decided that I'm going to take Willie out of here. Daddy, he doesn't stand a chance here anymore. They'll kill him too someday. And you, Daddy. They're going to kill you too. I know it. But by God, they'll have to do a sight better than they've done in the past. I guess that's why there's a covered walkway from the house to the store now? So they can't shoot you out in the open? Well, now, I suppose that does make it a little harder on them, don't it? I'm going back to the house now. I'll make us some dinner before too long. You come on in about noon. Bye, Daddy. Okay, my old girl. I'll be on after a while. Don't you worry about me none. Daddy. Stay out of that wind or whatever you do. Nancy, how's Car Turner doing? He's fine. He's out looking for his hogs again this morning. Car has more trouble with them hogs than a man ought to put up with. Butcher them things and be done with it. I'll buy the bacon and the lard. You tell him that. Won't well, do no good. He loves them hogs. He put so much stock in Miss Ellie when he went to butcher her. He done it right in my front room. Said he couldn't bear to cut her up in a dirty old barn. Of course, we couldn't build no far. It needed to be cold and such. Youngins took sick. Well, he just needs to get plumb over them hogs. Can I get you anything today, Nancy? No. I brought you some eggs. Two dozen. Them gold girls got good and busy last night. Them's fine looking eggs. You won't pay or swap today. Swap. I'll take a little poke of sugar and a plug of that there chewing backer. to know. Sir, my name is John Fox. Well, well, John Fox Jr. to be exact. Okay. Well, I ain't high sheriff no more, if that's what you need. Where are you from, Mr. Fox? Oh, I started out here in Kentucky, up Stony Point. But I live over in Virginia now, a uh, big stone gap. You look familiar, Mr. Fox. Have we met? Indeed we have, Mr. Callahan, sir. Though it appears you don't remember I suppose I can see why. Uh, I stopped by a few years ago when you were in the hospital. 
well, after you've been shot. Okay. Seems like I do remember you now. You write books. I've heard of you. Oh, I've been known to write a few books here and there. Mr. Callahan, sir. Call me Ned. <laughs> Ned. No, I know a little bit about you. And I know more than a little about human nature. And you, sir, serve as a fascination to me. Is that so? Well, well shot in the leg. And, and shot in the stomach. And yet, you held on. Now, you of all people should be afraid today, a day such as this. But you, sir, show not even the least sign of fear. Now, how can that be? Well, Mr. Fox, a man that's afraid Ain't got no business being in Breathitt County. <laughs> and that's all I know about that. <clears throat> and so, in spite of what may lie ahead, you do not intend to leave? No, sir. For I would then be a coward. <laughs> and that, sir, I can definitely see you are not. Can you stay for a while? No. I have to be on my way. It has indeed been a pleasure, Mr. Callahan, sir. Ned. Mr. Fox. Ma'am. back from Louisville last week. They're just too hard to carry. Hmm. Bob, you got any doodles to swap? <laughs> Millie's home. Just run on down here and talk to her, Nancy. She'll fix you up. Right, grateful, Bob. Well, I best be on my way, you fellas. Thanks for the chow. My regards to Carl. You take care today, Ned. Ned, she's 
sure said the truth. You better be on the look today. I hear them other deacons as a plan and something. Fletch and Willie and some of them Smiths likely a laying for you, maybe right out there in them hills. I don't have no doubt that they are, Bob. <laughs> That peace agreement we signed two years ago probably don't mean nothing more than that sack of flyer there. But life has to go on. Well, Ned, I've been with you for 25 years now. We've been through a lot. I took a big chance of killing James Deaton for you all them years ago and him being my own kin. But old feller, there's just too many of them out there a gunning for you. Uh, you've just got to be careful. Bob, I put all that behind me now. I'm a deacon in the church. And I don't put that much stock in the clan like I once did. I want peace with all good citizens and I ask all the people of the county to give me their trade. I'll sell them goods as cheap as anyone else. Then, you and Fargus were behind killing at least five men. All their kinfolk ain't gone. Now just because some jury in another part of Kentucky said they decided you didn't do nothing to them? Well, their people back here don't quite look at it that way, brother. I don't believe that God will suffer assassins to kill me. My intentions and aims are high and right. Ned, you're one of my best friends, and I'll be with you till the end. But you better take mighty good care, especially today. It's May 4th, nine years to the day since J.B. Markham was killed, and you were sitting right there, close enough to smell the smoke from Curtis Jett's pistol. And two years to the day, since they shot you out of the hill across Long's Creek. I know what day it is, Bob. I got a stack of newspapers over there in the corner from every paper in these here United States uh, telling the story. You'd think they had better things to think about in New York City and Washington, D.C. than to worry about what's happening right here on Long's Creek. Makes me awful damn mad, Bob. It sure does. Well, if the judge was still Don't there, start up on the judge. He's been gone four years now. And like I said, Bob, I've moved on. Hello, Asbury. What's up, old feller? Howdy, Bob. Dead. What are you after today? I need me some war. My cow keeps a nosing out of the barn lot. Can you show me what you got, Ned? I've got plenty over there in front of the window, Asbury. Dip yourself. This is Ned. Yes, I'll hold. Hello? J. Wise Higgins, is that you? I can't hear you very well. Yes. Yes. Well, you know what I want. I want that little piece out of the Breathitt County News from... What? Talk louder. Yes from December 4, 1906. 
and I want you to run that ad for my store in next week's paper as well. Send me a bill for it. That's all I need. Goodbye. Good to hear you and Jay Wise is made up. By God, we ain't made up. And I don't say no more to that newspaper man than need be. After all he wrote about me over the years, he's a lucky man, Bob. You know I don't take that off of many of people. Well, just settle it out. I, I didn't mean to get you all riled up. Ned, I don't see none of the number three like I want. Just hold on, Asbury, and let me see. Right there it is, a dollar fifty a row. And I got some more back. Ned Callahan would not survive this last attempt on his life. He would die a few days later in the little hospital in Buckhorn. His daughter Lillian would pursue those men that killed her father and eventually a host of Deaton's and Smith's were charged and some even went to prison. But they didn't stay there long. Pardoned by Judge Morrow after serving a few years. <laughs> but folks, that was, in effect, the end of the killings of the great Breathitt County few. <laughs> yes, indeed. Those were some times. And this old town has seen its share of heartbreak. And well, I guess we'd better wrap this up. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> Folks, I want to thank you for humoring an old man. Those were some times. Well, I'll see you on the train.
want to take just a, little, a moment to thank a few people. Sandy Gabhart, she's over in the wings here. She had not stepped up. This would not be half the show that you saw here tonight. She was our assistant director. It's just hard to say everything that she was responsible for, the organization, the, the props, uh, just helping me out, directing everything. She is incredible, and I guarantee you I'm going to be calling on her again. <laughs> so, I want to thank our producer, Mr. Sean Reeves. And It is just hard to describe everything that this guy did, uh, from our publicity to finding Doug over here for the lights and the sound. And Doug, by the way, just give it up. <laughs> producer for this for this kind of show is I couldn't do it. I wouldn't even know where to begin. So uh, it's such an important role. And Sean, you did a fantastic job for us. Uh, Terry. Gab Hart, right over here. The judge, this badass right here. <laughs> the proscenium, which, by the way, turned this show into a bear. <laughs> tell you what, it was a hoss, but I think it was worth it. Uh, I'm probably going to use it in everything I do going forward. So, but Terry helped build the proscenium. He built the the props on the st the, the counter, uh, the window. I mean, this guy's an engineer. So he did a phenomenal job. Uh, and I want to thank Taylor Bakentine. Yes. <laughs> this young lady, okay, she did some research and she is actually related to Lillian Callahan, the character that she is playing. That's really the incredible part. She did our stage. She did our backdrops, our flats, the skins. She designed them. She painted them. Came up with it all and, and did it pretty much by herself. So thank you very much, Taylor. <laughs> this was a big show. We had a lot of cast. Uh, Patrick drove in from Lexington so many times to be with us over here. Uh, we, we had folks. come in from Pleasureville. Uh, Pleasureville. Pleasureville. <laughs> in no way at all Newcastle. Not even close to uh, We had Lawrenceburg. We had Shelbyville. We had folk. Jeff came in from Shelbyville as did Bill. And uh, Cook came from, I think you live in Shelbyville. I think Shelby. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so we had people come in from everywhere. And it was, uh, you know, six weeks. Of hard work for everybody and let me tell you what uh, you know they say it takes a village and it does for community theater so I want to thank these people <laughs> uh, thank you all and I hope you all stay around and a lot of you out there that we know I'd like for everybody to come on up and meet the cast and say hello so thank you all again thank you all so much <laughs>